We're here at Gettysburg in order to document the fact that the uh, House of Rothschild banking fraternity dominated by the Bank of England during the Civil War and they were simply establishing their banking operations here in America through personalities such as August Belmont and Jacob Schiff which ultimately resulted in the formation of the Federal Reserve Bank which is Rothschild America Incorporated. I want to tell you that the Civil War was actually instigated by the House of Rothschild. The House of Rothschild financed to a great degree the abolitionist movement and at the same time uh, financed the South. Benjamin, Judah P. Benjamin was the head of the he was at one point Secretary of State and Secretary of Treasury of the South and he was a Rothschild agent. At the end, end of the war he packed up as much gold as he could, got on a ship and delivered the gold to his master, his Lord Master Rothschild after the Civil War. At the same time the Rothschilds were financing the abolitionist movement to stir up hatred between the North and the South. So during the war Abraham Lincoln was running out of money. The North was running out of money and Lincoln had put advances to the New York banks but they told him that they would only loan him money from 27 to 34 percent interest and he uh, realized that he could not afford to borrow money at such a rate so he went to a friend of his from Chicago uh, back in Illinois who advised him that the best thing that he could do was to print new money uh, issued by the government and those are called the greenbacks so when the greenbacks were issued they were used to supply the northern armies and to uh, also pay off the uh, supply distributors merchants what have you that uh, sold goods to the US military and in this way he circumvented the New York bankers and issued government money that money is the Lincoln greenback those greenbacks stayed in circulation until 1964 not incurring a single dime's worth of interest in the hundred years that they were in circulation. Now we contrast that to the Federal Reserve note which is always issued by the Federal Reserve Bank as a interest bearing note. Whatever the current interest rate is by the Federal Reserve Bank it could be whatever they decide it is. They, they simply make up the rules and Congress has no say about it, although Congress is supposed to regulate the Federal Reserve. Congress has never done that and is supposed to audit the Federal Reserve and has never done that either. So in the hundred years of its existence now, we are recording this in 2010, the Federal Reserve has never been supervised or audited by Congress, which it is supposed to be. First off, the Federal Reserve Act, which was passed in 1913 under the administration of Woodrow Wilson, is unconstitutional because the Constitution says very clearly that Congress is to coin money and regulate the value thereof. There's no provision in the Constitution that gives Congress the authority to establish a private bank to issue America's money. Very, very few people understand the difference between the American free enterprise system and capitalism. The difference is this, and very, very few textbooks go into this. Capitalism is when you have Jewish bankers issuing the money supply to whatever country they happen to be operating in. Free enterprise is when the government issues the currency without any interest being incurred, incurred by the user. So automatically, the Federal Reserve banknote has interest bearing to it, and that's why they also passed the IRS amendment, the Income Tax Amendment, the 16th Amendment, which put the uh, onus on the taxpayer to pay the interest on the debt that was incurred to the bankers by our government. Both of those acts are unconstitutional because the Constitution prohibits a head tax directly upon the citizens of the several states. Any revenue that the federal government is supposed to obtain is directly from the states, not from the citizens of those states. 
So we have two very unconstitutional acts passed under the Woodrow Wilson administration. And in addition, at the same time, I like to refer to it as the Devil's Trident, Wilson, the Wilson administration passed the Tax Exempt Corporations Act, by which these very rich corporations are exempt from the taxes that you and I, the American citizens, thus have to pay. Now we're going to uh, move our setting to uh, a different monument, and we're going to start by discussing how America began as a nation opposing the international bankers. The American people need to understand that the Revolutionary War was fought against not just England and George III, but it was fought against the Bank of England. The Bank of England is the instigator against the colonies. Benjamin Franklin said that the real reason for the Revolutionary War was the fact that the Bank of England refused to allow the colonies to have their own currency. And uh, just like the Federal Reserve note, which is an interest-bearing note, the script that was issued by the Bank of England to the colonies in those days was interest-bearing notes. And Benjamin Franklin took a trip to England and was asked by many British bankers and statesmen why the colonies were so prosperous. Because uh, Benjamin Franklin looked around and saw the horrible conditions in which the British people were living. There was t uh, tremendous poverty everywhere. And the reason for that was because the bankers of the Bank of England and other banks in Britain were stealing funds from the British people via usury. Now, usury is forbidden in the Bible, yet we have people who think that the Jews are God's chosen people, which they, of course, are not. They are Edomites, Canaanites, and Kenites of the Old Testament, pretending to be Israel, pretending to be Judah. And if they were actually living the law of Moses, they would not be practicing usury. Usury is explicitly forbidden in the Bible in many places. And uh, no Christian pastor ever holds these Jewish bankers to account for the fact that they are violating the law of Moses. Now, if they constantly violate the law of Moses, how can they, po how can they possibly be God's chosen people, Israel? Anyway, Benjamin Franklin made the statement to several bankers while he was in Britain that the reason why America was so prosperous is because America has its own money, issues its own money, interest-free. And when the uh, bankers heard this, they realized that they weren't making any profit off the uh, money, off the currency that was in circulation in the colonies at that time. When Benjamin Franklin came back to America, uh, he saw that the certain colonies were better off than others, and the difference was usually because those uh, colonies which had a, a unfluctuating currency, a currency that did not, did not fluctuate up and down in value, those colonies were better off than the colonies that had fluctuating values of currency. So this was the reason why our Constitution states that the U.S. dollar is defined as 371.25 grains of silver, and it cannot be anything else but silver or gold coin. Congress shall make this gold and silver coin the currency of the nation is exactly what the Constitution says and uh, it does not per, uh, permit paper money if paper money should be issued it should be tied to the value of the gold and silver it cannot fluctuate however this has not held true whenever the bankers take over a nation's currency they issue paper money first they issue paper money that's either backed by gold and silver to get the people used to paper money and then after a while, after people get used to that paper money, they withdraw the gold and silver banking, uh, backing rather, so that they don't have to uh, back up the script, the paper script, with actual gold and silver. And that leads to fractional reserve banking, which means that they can, w within their banks, they only hold, let's say, 10% of actual cash. We're not even talking about gold and silver anymore. The actual cash on hand in any given bank is no more than 10% of what's uh, out of circulation or what they pretend to have in the bank. So these bankers are, it's a Ponzi scheme. 
that uh, ultimately when there's a panic and people go to their banks and are afraid that the uh, bank is going to collapse and want to take their money out, they find that only 10% of the actual money they claim to have is there in the bank. And that's what's called fractional reserve banking. This goes all the way back to ancient Babylon when the Babylonian bankers of those days issued clay tablets, which were promissory notes, receipts for goods that a person could exchange for the actual goods at a bank. They devised this uh, system of inflation by uh, creating receipts, promissory notes, as clay tablets for non-existent goods. And that's exactly how paper money works today. It's a pr uh, it used to be a promissory note where you could take, if you look at the uh, the silver certificates, which Johnson took out of circulation in 1964, it would say on that promissory note, pay to the bearer on demand so much silver. And if you took that promissory note to a bank, they would have to give you that much silver in exchange for that piece of paper. But after the Kennedy assassination, Lyndon Baines Johnson eliminated the silver backing and then issued Federal Reserve notes which had no bank backing whatsoever. And that is why we have had such tremendous inflation ever since the assassination of Kennedy with, uh, with the, val the price of goods, not the value, the price of goods escalating to practically 100% of its value back in the 1960s. Now, after Benjamin Franklin had uh, told the British bankers that the reason for America's prosperity was the fact that they were issuing their own money, which was not controlled by the Bank of England, the Bank of England began to issue proclamations forcing the colonies to use the Bank of England's money and also pay taxes and pay the interest on that money. And Bank Benjamin Franklin specifically stated that the true reason for the American Revolution was the fact that the colonies were no longer permitted to issue their own money. After the Revolution, the, the Continental Congress, in creating the Constitution of the United States, specifically declared that only gold and silver coin could be money. They had no faith in paper money because paper money is so easily inflated, especially if it's not backed by anything. So, but they had tremendous debt incurred because of the Revolutionary War. And this is where Alexander Hamilton comes in. Alexander Hamilton was a close confidant of General Washington during the war, had, uh, was very courageous in battle, and therefore was highly regarded by Washington. But it was ha Alexander Hamilton who instigated the creation of the first bank of the United States. As a result of that Hamilton's operations, the first bank of the United States was given a 20-year charter and by which the Congress could borrow money from the first bank of the United States in order to pay the debts of the Revolutionary War. This charter, when it was up, uh, was, uh, had to be debated again by the Congress, but the uh, Congress refused to renew the charter and refused to create the second bank of the United States. It was at this point that the Rothschilds, who actually controlled the first bank of the United States, told the Congress that if you refuse to grant the second charter for the second bank of the United States, they would send their military over and make war against America again. And that was the reason for the War of 1812. After the Congress failed to ratify the charter for the Second Bank of the United States, the British sent their troops in once again, and that was the reason for the War of 1812. Very few his history books actually explain why the War of 1812 happened. And it's because these history books are controlled by the international bankers of the House of Rothschild, and they simply do not want you to know that the background uh, subversive activities of these international bankers were the real causes of these wars. And when the, the Congress failed to ratify the second charter, the British army was sent again by the Bank of England to make war against the United States of America. And after the War of 1812, which we again won, the uh, 
the second bank was chartered for another 20-year period leading up to the days of Andrew Jackson and his struggles against the Bank of England. After the charter of the Second Bank of the United States uh, was over, the Rothschilds wanted the Americans to establish a third bank, and eventually their purpose was to establish a permanent bank, which we did eventually get with the Federal Reserve Bank in 1913. But Andrew Jackson campaigned against the bankers and said that I will throw the bankers out. And uh, he said to those bankers, you are a den of vipers and I will rout you out. That was his attitude toward these bankers. When he became president, he made political war against the international bankers. And uh, there was an assassination attempt against him. A, uh, an assassin had two weapons aimed at Jackson at point-blank range, but both weapons misfired, and the person was prosecuted and declared insane. However, it was later discovered that he was under the employ uh, employment of the House of Rothschild. On Andrew Jackson's tombstone, he told the people to inscribe these words, I killed the bank. Again, the history books do not explain the terrible relationship between the American presidency, uh, including George Washington, James Madison, uh, John Adams, uh, Andrew Jackson, etc., that these men understood that banks were the principal enemy of the United States of America. In fact, uh, Thomas Jefferson said that the bankers are greater enemies to America than standing armies. After the Jackson administration, uh, the years leading up to the Civil War, it, it's clear to us that the House of Rothschild did everything possible to instigate the Civil War because they understood that the American presidents were not interested in having a national bank, a private national bank, run by private bankers for their own profit. The, our presidents understood this. They were students of the economy. They were students of history. And for this reason, every single one of these presidents opposed a private national bank. But during the Civil War, as I explained earlier, Lincoln began to run out of money. And by printing the greenbacks, he incurred the wrath of the House of Rothschild, which commissioned John Wilkes Booth to assassinate Lincoln so that by the end of the war, they could use their power and their grip over the Congress to institute their own currency, which is what they did exactly after the Civil War. That's the, reason, the real reason why Lincoln was assassinated. So now we have two attempts, one a failed attempt to assassinate Andrew Jackson and the successful assassination of Abraham Lincoln. We find also that uh, McKinley was assassinated and James Garfield also was assassinated. And in both cases, we find that the international bankers have a direct vested interest in getting rid of these men because they also opposed a private national bank. Since the international bankers have been trying to finagle a way to issue America's paper currency ever since the American Revolution, and they attempted to assassinate Andrew Jackson and successfully assassinated Abraham Lincoln, James Garfield, and William McKinley, their attempts to control America's currency never stopped. Ultimately, they supported Woodrow Wilson as the President of the United States. And the, Woodrow Wilson, throughout his entire career, was backed by the bankers. Even in his days at Princeton, where he was receiving $5,000 a month from various bankers to, to keep his career going, they were priming him for a run for the presidency. 
During his days at Princeton, he had an affair with a Boston socialite by the name of Mary Peck. And he, I guess you could say he was the William Clinton of the 1900s. And the Rothschild, being aware of this, used this information as blackmail to make sure that he would do what they wanted while he was president. And during his presidency in the year 1913, Wilson, uh, through various legislators uh, such as Nelson Aldrich and uh, James Warburg and various other bankers, proposed the Federal Reserve re legislation, the Federal Reserve Act. It was the passage of this act in 1913 which created the Federal Reserve Bank which has operated America's currency ever since and utilized it for its own profit robbing the American taxpayers of their hard-earned money and uh, giving the American government the bill for all of the wars that subsequently followed and for the depressions and the panics that, that were all created by the House of Rothschild. Thank you.